Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Uh, I have one of the board members, uh, Dr. Nasha Winters. She's a physician and an author. Uh, she's also a survivor of a major medical issue, which we'll discuss. And I wanted to talk to her today because um, from what she said, there's a good percentage of the patients she works with that have anxiety and depression and stress. And uh, it sounds like she's been able to help quite a few of them with her techniques. So I wanted to find out what those were. So Nasha, thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. And it's a privilege to be part of your amazing and very important um, foundation. So I, I really am, am honored to, to be of service to you and to support all of these folks that are coming to you for support. Yeah. Thank you. Well, tell listeners, um, I know you had a, a you know, a, a terrible uh, insides liquefying diagnosis years ago. So what happened there and, you know, how did you come to today? And then we'll get to treating patients. Sure. Like anybody who gets drawn to the field of oncology, whether as a conventional oncologist or a naturopathic oncologist, which is where my lens um, of training um, came from, we didn't do it by just waking up one day and saying, hey, I think it'd be a great career in cancer. You know, <laughs> it was something that drew us in from a very personal experience, either within ourselves, which was my case, or someone very near and dear to you. You know, one of the things I say to people is that uh, 20 years ago, when I would present at medical conferences, and even upwards of 10 years ago, I would ask the audience to raise their hand if anybody who's had a personal experience with, or a very close relationship with someone who's dealt with cancer. And at that time, you know, I'd say about 50% of the room raised their hand, which was still a lot. Today, I've had to reframe that question to ask how many of you in this room have not had a direct experience with cancer or with someone very close to you with cancer. And now I might be lucky if one or two hands go up in the room. So wow. in a very, right. And that's one thing that shocked me is like in a very short period of time, these are the same medical conferences I've presented at for years, anywhere from a few hundred to well over a thousand in the room. That's concerning to me. And so with that, with, you know, kind of knowing that it's affected all of us now, my own story back in the early 90s, um, and actually beyond, I had a, a pretty significant family history of cancer on both sides of my family, both my mother and my father's side. And then with that, I also um, was born with a lot of health issues. I mean, my mom describes me as 
uh, as having a lot of GI issues, a lot of symptoms as a, as a baby. Um, I had a lot of health issues. I had to be put on basically the equivalent of like baby Zantac and, you know, uh, Pepsi, you know, AC as, as an, as a toddler and a young, as a young kid because of my GI symptoms. And so, you know, just to give examples, I was pretty unhealthy from the get go. And because I was later diagnosed with IBS by the time I was 11 years old, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome by the time I was 19, a thyroid condition, uh, or excuse me, by the time I was 14, a thyroid condition. I had terrible cystic acne. I had terrible digestive symptoms, lots of chronic pain. By the time I was 19, my symptoms were so bad that whenever I would land in the ER for the summer of my sophomore year in college in 1991, everyone just thought it was an exacerbation of my old diagnoses. And so it limited them from looking any further. And so speaking of what we're going to speak to today about the mental emotional it was incredibly distressful to basically be treated like a hypochondriac, like a hypochondriac. And yeah, like, that, that's what I was uh, yeah. just going to say. Yeah. I, I know it's a ter- not a nice admission, but I remember there was a girl that I went to school with in high school and she was always sick. And I was going to be honest, like instead of feeling bad for her after a while, I just, I didn't like her because she was constantly sick. I just somehow thought like, what's wrong with you? Just stop being sick already. And it, it, it's weird. I don't know why I, had, why I had that reaction. And I hope that you haven't had that, but I felt it. I just have to be honest about it. Well, I did have that reaction. I had that reaction from people so much in my life that I basically then chose to not tell people what I was going through. So for me, I basically stuffed my feelings. I basically, you know, medicated them. I lived on Advil for all the pain and Tylenol for all the pain. I, I ate Tums like it was candy. I, I suppressed my symptoms as much as I could. You know, I, I, I kept quiet. I didn't tell anybody of my experience because I got so tired of people also treating me differently. You know, they, they, they did have that sort of like, oh, for the love of God, get over it, you know, and no one could physically experience what it was that I was experiencing, which added further insult to injury on my psychology, which was one of extreme anxiety and extreme depression. And the depression, Richard, to to the point where when I was 16 years old, I attempted to take my own life and and even attempted to take my own life when I was 18 years old. And so it was that bad that I, I did not see any will to live and any reason to live. And I could not even possibly visualize that I could have a different existence in the world or in my body. And so fast forward to this summer where I was in pre-med, I was, you know, killing myself working too much. I worked two full-time jobs. I was taking a huge, heavy, heavy course load and, you know, biology and chemistry major. I was just like, cause that was my distraction, right? Busyness was my distraction from my illness. It was the only way that gave me any sense of self was to be looking outside of my body. And so I filled every second with something to do. And in that summer, when I was failing miserably at even being able to do that, and in the ER, and then suddenly being put in that situation again, where they treated me like I was crazy, it wasn't until I landed in the hospital, unable to breathe, with a belly bigger than a nine month, you know, pregnancy belly, incredibly malnourished, uh, in such severe pain that I couldn't like the, I was vomiting from the pain, no Tylenol or, or, you know, ibuprofen would touch it. And I was unable to eat anything. And I started to throw up constantly anything I put in and then started to throw up feces. Now that's a little TMI through, but that is what we call in stage, you know, organ and failure and bowel blockage. Is 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 that when, um, People like throw up what looks like coffee yep. grounds. Yep. Well, more than that, it was actual fecal matter because it couldn't go down because I had a blockage. So it would start to digest in my stomach and in my small intestine and then would hit the hit the blockage and have to come up. And the blockage was from tumors from my liver pressing on my colon. So it was finally then when I was that sick that they woke up and did the proper testing to figure out instead of just dismissing me. And I tell you this God awful part of the story is because I was dismissed for so long that it almost took my life. And it just added insult to injury for the psychology that I'd already been swimming in for many, 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 many years. And so in that moment, when I was diagnosed, they recognized that I had stage four ovarian cancer. I was end of life. I was so sick. 
Um, they gave me a few months to live and then they couldn't even offer treatment because my organs had shut down. My liver had shut down, my kidney had shut down. I had the blockage. I had wa- liquid flow out my whole abdomen wrapped around my heart and in my lungs. And so it was a matter of life and death for weeks on end. And they sent me home to die. And so how old were you at this time? I was 19. I was just shy. So I was 19 when I ended up in the hospital, but it, my di- my official diagnosis did not come for several weeks. This is, the, this is 1991, mind you. So um, testing and imagery and all those things took weeks to get. So they probably weren't even aware that I'd be alive um, to get the data because no one bothered to reach out to me when the data did come in. I had to do that myself, which on a- October 21st, 1991 is when I was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer with metastasis to my liver, um, peritoneal implants and carcinomatosis, malignant ascites, pleural effusions, and in-stage organ failure and a bowel blockage. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. This is uh, the point where yeah. listeners realize it's 30 years. Yeah, she was only exactly. given a few months to live. So I yeah. was thinking, how did she do it? But go ahead exactly. Now. exactly. And that is exactly what segues nicely into this next conversation, which is what we're talking about today is sort of the emotional side of healthcare, the emotional side of a, of a cancer diagnosis. And it was in that moment when I was actually told that I was not going to live and that there were no options that lit a fire inside of me, that lit the pilot light, that that basically returned me into the body um, and the container that I was inhabiting and, and, and made me want to live. Now, I want your listeners to know that I had no illusion that I was going to live, but I found the desire to live again. And that enough, that alone was enough for me to have some deep clarity and some peace. But what it did do for me was it created a curiosity and a desire that before I leave, I want to understand why I got here. I had some instincts around it, but I wanted to understand more. Mm-hmm. Before we go into this, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, so what, I mean, maybe it's just a foolish question, but what caused you to become more anxious when you were sick? What caused you to become mm-hmm. depressed? Was it internal? Was it how the doctors treated you? Was it, you know, you just, you're facing death. I mean, was it all those things? Like what was it? Leading up to my diagnosis. So now a lot of what I'm going to tell you is, you know, that hindsight's 2020. So there are things now I understand about myself that I, of course I would not have understood in the moment. So a little perspective, we have something today known as the ACE score, adverse childhood events score. This, any of your listeners can go and Google that and take the 10 question quiz themselves and get a sense of what exposures they had before the age of 18 that might've led to a more uh, dysfunctional ability to function in the world. So it leads to higher incidence of mental illness and higher incidence of chronic illness and cancer. So basically for every yes you have on those 10 questions, they relate to various traumas and experiences of neglect from childhood. Um, you have a much higher incidence of all of those conditions I just mentioned. So just to give perspective, I was a 10 out of 10 on that score. So I came from pretty extreme circumstances. So that alone would have compelled anyone to be like, well, that explains it. That's one set of sort of factors playing in was the actual trauma. The other side of my trauma, which I didn't, uh, another piece that was happening was Remember I told you I had GI issues since coming out of the womb, basically. Part of that was I wasn't breastfed and I was put on formula. And my mom tells a story that I basically threw up every single formula. So I was reacting to everything, which showed I had a lot of GI inflammation and upset. Our gut houses the majority of our neurotransmitters 
which basically, as my husband, the biochemist says, there's only two things that make you happy. That's serotonin and dopamine. And so basically, if you've got problems in your gut, you've got problems with how you utilize serotonin and dopamine, which means that set me up at a very young age with a lot of GI difficulties to also not have emotional resilience and to be between the trauma of my environment and the abuse in my environment that wiring in my gut also made me very susceptible to not having the resilience and the resources in order to deal with those exposures. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And then let's add another layer, insult to injury. I learned many, many years later, actually deep into my late 20s, early 30s, that I have celiac disease at the genetic level, not just at the um, superficial allergic level. So I have the genetics celiac, which is a severe gluten intolerance. And my diet was pretty much gluten on gluten with gluten on the side. I was a carboholic. That was how I self-soothed. Um, and that was, and that's what a lot of people do. Um, in fact, just to give um, a, an interesting factoid, we used to call schizophrenia back in the 1940s, bread brain. That's what it was known as. Really? And so we still understand that, um, and, and unfortunately in psych units and you know psychiatry, psychiatry offices all over the place, they never have the discussion of diet, diet with their schizophrenic patients, but we know that gluten intolerance is, is a real deal and that celiac is often an underlying component of their psychoses. And so there was that level. So I had this genetic component, I had this trauma component, and I had this disrupted micro microbiome and GI tube that made my neurotransmitter, you know, balance even more disrupted. And so those were probably the three primary drivers of just my psychology. And honestly, I lived in a household where there was no emotional intelligence to be had, you know, and so I was sort of on my own in that piece. And and so those were kind of the backup pieces that led to that diagnosis. And it was being in college and having access to a, a quote unquote free counseling on my campus that became a lifeline. And one of the biggest and first experiences I had was a new addition to the psych department or to the counseling department of my college was a young woman who had just completed her training and had just started working for the college as a therapist. And she was just starting out and trying on a newer therapy on patients. And I was a willing participant. And that therapy back in 1991, which I give a lot of credit to overriding a lot of these patterns I spoke to was EMDR, a particular rapid eye movement therapy that has been really well studied and um, uh, to show its impact on trauma resolution. What does EMDR stand for? Oh, for the love of God, I knew you were going to ask me that. I can't tell you. Right, like emotional. There you go. It's like emotional. It's, it's, a, it's a rapid eye movement technique, but you can easily Google EMDR therapy. Here it is, yes. Perfect. It's eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. There you go. So elegant. I just know that it worked. It helped a lot uh, of, of pieces for me. Um, you know, those were just some pieces under the way. But I, I tell you this story so that people understand that when they look at me today, people are like, my God, you're like the most positive, energetic, happy person on the planet. And I want them to recognize that that wasn't always so. And especially when I even learned later into um, the mid, you know, around 2008, that my epigenetics, so the, the, the blueprint in which I was given in this lifetime, I am very much wired for stress, depression, and anxiety. I have particular epigenetic hiccups with my catecholamine production, with the way I process dopamine, with the way I process neurotransmitters of all kinds, and that it leaves me basically in this sort of fragile, kind of friable environment of anxiety. And ironically, I have epigenetic hiccups that make it so that the pharmaceuticals that would have normally been dished out to me like M&Ms in a bowl actually either A, do not work, or B, make it much worse. And that's about 70% of the population, by the way. So when we are quick to put folks on these prescriptions, we actually are adding insult to injury or just doing nothing at all. So that's a little context for the background. And 
Um, I thought I'd take a little breath and a pause there and see if there's anything else you want to unpack there before I tell you kind of where this has taken me since all of that. So what do you see in patients? So what are the primary drivers of anxiety, depression? Perfect. Well, I mean, one of the things that happened after this diagnosis, and this will answer this question here in a moment, was I was a, a dual ma- I was a, a dual major in biology and chemistry as a, as a major. I changed after my diagnosis and a break from, I took a semester off school to just sort of get my affairs in order and happen to still be alive at the end of that. Um, I went back to school and switched my major to a major in psychology because I figured I needed to understand the trauma in which I came from and a minor in biology because I understood some of the physiological underpinnings. I was fascinated with neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and I actually created a self-constructed major known as psychoneuroimmunology. Now, this is back in 1991. These were new concepts then, okay? Um, Even though Dr. Ader, Robert Ader's work um, who coined psychoneuroimmunology, I believe started in the early 80s, people like Candace Pert and later Bruce Lipton and others were able to actually put the science and the data behind the reality that our Our thoughts, our traumas, our experiences impact our physiology, and our physiology impacts our thoughts and our beliefs and our experiences. So I was really interested in that, and that's where I started to focus my training. And so fully back to your specific question of what causes this, I already spoke to at least three of them. One of them is, of course, that nature-nurture environment. Those ACE scores is very integral. I have every single client I work with take an ACE questionnaire. I want to understand what they were exposed to before the age of 18. Number two, I take a very good look at their epigenetics, at their blueprint. I want to understand their inner workings of what foods, what supplements, what medications turn on or off switches within them that will be unique to them and them alone. Number, and that can also show me a lot of nutritional deficiencies as well, which also leads. So for instance, zinc deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, omega-3 fatty acid deficiency are very common in our patients with depression. And things like magnesium deficiency are very common in our patients with anxiety. And so I take a nice audit via laboratory assessment on how their nutrients are and how their cofactors are. I also look at things like their oat test, their organic acids profile. That tells me an enormous amount of their neurotransmitter uh, metabolism and response, as well as gut activity and mitochondrial activity. And then I talk to the genetics of, you know, do they actually have the genetics for certain, you know, uh, like the, like celiac. So celiac for many people affects the gut, but it just as readily affects the brain. And usually if you have the brain on fire, the gut will be on fire, or if the gut's on fire, the brain's on fire. And so you can have it um, show up in those places. And the other thing we know with patients dealing with chronic anxiety and depression is they're often under or misdiagnosed with a thyroid condition. And so I think you and I talked about this off off the show at one point that um, one of the things we see most often is is misdiagnosis of bipolar disorder when it's actually Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis. Because with Hashimoto's autoimmune, the body is a teeter-totter of going hyper and hypothyroid, which makes you anxious or depressed in any given moment, in any given day, in any given week or any given month. And that can be misconstrued as a bipolar disorder when in fact it's a, it's a physiological disorder. And the one, the biggest aggravator of Hashimoto's is gluten. So it ties these things back in again. Yes, we want to look at trauma. We want to look at the epigenetics. We want to look at the genetics. We want to look at the nutritional status. And we want to look at, you know, kind of the things that could be impacting the gut health and the brain health, which could also be pointing us in the direction of neurotoxins. So there's a lot to unpack here. And I talk about in my book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, the 10 drops in the bucket. Any one of those drops can be the the root cause of a mental emotional disparity. I would guess that, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I would think there's archetypes. Mm -hmm. Uh, X percentage of your clients, 10, 20, 30% seem to have, you know, these issues. And then another percentage has those issues. I would think that, I know everyone's different. I know everyone's unique, but still, I would think that there are X number of major archetypes you see. So if so, what are they? 
Yeah. Well, um, in my world, because I focus on cancer, we talk about the type C personality. It is an archetype. It's a, it's a very much this, I put everybody else first. I'm hyper responsible. I take care of everybody else's needs first. I'm highly driven. You know, that's a very type C personality. And the concept of putting on their own oxygen mask and self-care is almost unheard of until they get very sick. And with a type C personality, it's almost like they don't give themselves permission to self-care until they're sick. And that you can imagine sets up kind of a a double-edged sword, right? It's, it's because basically like I can't get my own needs met until I'm literally dying. That message is reverberating through every cell of their body. And we need to help rewire that messaging, right? Is that, is this, um, I think I know this kind of person is, unless their head's falling off, they're like, oh, I'm fine. I'll be okay. And they don't, they just dismiss everything going on with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you get that kind of presentation coming forward And then you also get the presentation of the somebody um, that's always anxious and fearful, no matter how much, you know, sort of soothing you do or, or um, support you give them, they're just wired for anxiety. And that's kind of the other main archetype I see is just someone who is just living in fear And, and fear shuts down our immune system. Fear drives metastasis. Fear puts our cortisol high, which will rev our insulin and suppress our immune system even further. And it ends up um, stimulating a lot of the growth factors for cancer. And so living in that place of constant fear is one edge of the sword. And the other one is living in the place of constant, I don't want to use the word denial because it's not quite that, but the, the constant sort of overcompensation if that makes sense of like, I'm fine. I got this. I'll take care of it for everybody and everything. So those are the two dominant personalities I see in the field that I work in. Obviously, as you mentioned, there are nuances to this and there's many others, but those I think for our time's sake are the ones to focus on of, of sort of the hypervigilant warrior and the extreme, um, timid, cautious, ancient, fearful, anxious, fearful worrier. And interestingly enough, that comes down to a very specific epigenetic expression on the catecholamine SNP that's known as COMT, capital C, capital O, capital M, capital T. You can Google that epigenetic hiccup and just type in calm T and cancer, calm T and cancer outcomes, calm T and cancer prognosis and cancer diagnosis. And you'll see this puppy plays a big role because you can be both hypervigilant with calm T issues and fearful based with calm T issues. And both of them tend to wire you towards a particular disposition to cancer or a cancering environment. What do you do with, I mean, it's, it, it feels to me like kind of like having asthma. You know, it's, it's very psychological. If I feel like, you know, I can't breathe exactly right, then I'm like, oh, I probably should have a shot of the inhaler. And if I don't have the inhaler with me, then it may make me worry and make me not be able to breathe. I'm worried about breathing. So how do you, how do you stop this downward spiral for people that are perpetually anxious or they don't take care of themselves? I love this question. And that kind of segues into in the early 90s, um, Dr. Jimmy C. Holland, H-O-L-L-A-N-D, um, the founding father of a field called psycho-oncology, actually put out a comprehensive text in 1998. But this field he started to talk about is what's helped us sort of create a means of supporting folks today. And it's this interdisciplinary field that is literally the intersection of the physical, the psychological, the social, and the behavioral aspects of the cancer experience. And not just for the patient, but for the patient's caregivers. And so this is also, um, you might see it termed psychiatric oncology or psychosocial oncology, But there are loads of people out there who read the literature, follow the literature, and use these guidelines. So that's where a lot of these folks, we focus on those traumas and the trauma resolution. We focus on the epigenetic drivers. We focus on the sort of nature-nurture drivers. We focus on maybe the dietary lifestyle drivers. And then we assess that for each individual. We take this test, assess, address, don't guess approach because you put 10 patients with anxiety that have cancer in a room and they're all going to have different reasons and triggers 
you know, to both have the cancer, but also to have the anxiety. So we want to get very, very clear and specific of what those are. But for the most part, there are some low hanging fruit that very much support all people, you know, whether you're the warrior or the worrier and, and can be a starting point. And our most powerful tool to consider is one that directly impacts a, a particular nerve called the vagal nerve. The vagus nerve is one of the 10, is one of the cranial nerves coming out of the skull and innervating different parts of our body. And the 10th nerve, the cranial nerve, the vagal nerve, innervates basically all of our organs and, and even down to um, impacting the rhythm of our breath and the rhythm of our heartbeat and the rhythm of our, of our peristalsis and our digestion, the rhythm of our bladder, you know, like our, our dumping of our biliary tract, the rhythm of the dumping of our bladder. So it's a big deal, this guy, in that it only functions well when it's in the parasympathetic sympathetic state, which is in the relaxed state. And it shuts down and becomes perturbed when it's in a constant state of sympathetic nervous system. So the running from the saber tooth tiger. And so the lowest hanging fruit is to find ways to engage that vagal nerve, reset and create more tone and make it more leaning towards that parasympathetic state so that all the body's physiologic processes are more effective and efficient. And that's with breath and breathing is free to all of us. And you'd be shocked, Richard, as I'm sure you already are aware, well, how many well, people breathing, don't breathing used to be breathing used to be free to all of us until these, uh, yeah. mandates, but yeah, yeah, it, thank you, exactly. Back. Point taken. <laughs> But it's amazing how many of us really don't breathe or breathe appropriately, you know, or breathe in a way that is actually beneficial to our body. Most of us are chronic, chronically hyperventilating, sub, you know, par, subpar oxygenating and not breathing in deep enough to engage that parasympathetic nervous system um, and that vagal nerve in a, in a, in a meaningful way. And so um, there are so many different breath sort of modalities. I mean, you, your, your, your listeners could just simply go and just Google breathing for vagal tone or breath work for cancer patients or breathing for anxiety or breathing for depression. And you'll find loads of great free resources and images and videos and articles and research to back, you know, all of this, to validate this. But one of the simplest ones is taking a deep slow breath in for four to six seconds and then an even slower exhalation slower breath out for um you know six to eight seconds so if you had a four breath in you'll do a six second out if you had a six second in you'll do an eight second out and repeating that three times can often really calm that anxiety pattern one quick idea. I've, I've tried sure. that many times. What I found, at least for me, it seems to work easier is I'll do like two counts in, three counts out. I'll do yes. it a couple of times. Then I'll go three counts in, four out, Love four it. In, five out. But I, I have to build up. I just can't like, especially if I'm agitated, I can't go from like zero to five count breath in or out and six in and out. I have to get there slowly. I think that is such an incredible piece of advice because you're right. A lot of people may not be able to get there right away. And I love that because even that, those little steps that you just outlined are just as beneficial. So that's really powerful. Some people find that the box breathing, which is, and to your point, it could be anywhere from two to four to six seconds, two seconds in, two seconds hold, two seconds out, two seconds, you know, hold, and then all over again. The, the typical box breathing is a four second in, four second hold, four second out, four second hold. Um, but you can go as little as two, to your point, if you're feeling really rattled, or if you're more seasoned with this, practice the six second breathing. I also encourage people to engage with like the free apps. There's little free apps for breathing, kind of breathing with the little geometric, you know, box that opens up and then closes down. So you have like a visual or even a sound that guides you because a lot of us are so unsure of how to breathe and breathe properly that having that visual or that sound cue is quite helpful. Um, a lot of people like to follow the work of people like Dr. Wim, or not Dr. but um, Wim Hof, 
He's got some cool breathing techniques. One of my other favorite teachers was Buteyko, Dr. Buteyko, B-U-T-E-Y-K-O. This mm. breathing, did you use his breathing? Because you mentioned asthma before, Richard, and he was who I used when I was learning about his breath work is what I would teach my patients with asthma to use. And they were able to avoid picking up the, um, in, in, you know, the inhalation medications. They were able to stay away from the steroids and the, the prostaglandin inhibitors. And it was incredible to see how breath made such a difference. I haven't done Butego's method directly, but I interviewed a few people that talked about it cool. and they were advocating breathing through your nose as much as possible. And, you know, but with them, I kind of ran into trouble. This is, this is years ago because my nose was stuffed up all the time. So if your nose is stuffed up, you can't breathe through your nose how much you want to. So what I did is I ended up changing my diet and that got rid of my 90% of my congestion and allergies. And then I was able to try methods like that. But no one mentions it. They're like, breathe through your nose instead of your mouth. Well, you can't do it if your nose is stuffed up. So you need something to start with. So same thing with the box breathing or the breathing you talked about. Like I've noticed when I've been agitated, I can't, I just can't do six and eight hours. I got to start with two. And then slowly as I relax, I can go longer and longer and longer. So that's why I mentioned it. I love those because again, you've got to like, wherever you can start is where you start. You know, I love when people always say, well, what's the best diet or the best breath work or the best exercise? Well, frankly, it's the one you'll do. And so, you know, whichever one gets you started is really, really, really powerful. Um, and so, you know, breath is definitely our free resource. The, the secondary resource, which tends to be universal and safe, you know, kind of GRS, GRAS, generally regarded as safe, is magnesium. And so if people are also dealing with constipation, I might have them bring on magnesium citrate. If they're just anxious and have typically loose stools, then I have them use magnesium glycinate. But magnesium is like nature's little anxiolytic. It's an incredibly powerful tool. And given that our soil is so depleted in it, and given that most of us are you know, running around terribly magnesium deficient, it's an incredibly powerful and you know, a very low cost resource for folks to use as well. And I, I tell yeah. people the rule of thumb with magnesium is to take it up to bowel tolerance, meaning take it until your stools mm. become quite watery um, and then back it down a notch. And that's your sweet spot. Well, quick question here. Um, the breathing, I felt it helps, but it's, so there's this trade-off, you know, I've taken medication. I'm sure everyone listening has medication is like a punch to the head. It's very strong, yeah. but when you come off of it, yeah, you, know, you may have side effects while you're on it. When you come off of it, you're like, uh, I don't feel good. These supplements, these natural methods, the breathing, et cetera, magnesium, they're not as strong. And I think a lot of people may be disappointed, like, oh, it didn't take everything away. Right. But the nice benefits is you don't get side effects. Exactly. And, you know, you know, when you come off of it, you don't feel awful. So maybe you could discuss that. Um, sure. The sure. therapies you employ, like how much do they help? And what happens if someone's like, yeah, I took the edge off, but it's not enough. You know, so for that, it's like, I look at those pieces that, again, if someone was coming to me, I would be doing a full assessment of who they are. And then I would know what other tools to bring in that are strong enough, that do give that impact, that do give that sort of desired effect that have a similar to a pharmacological effect. But when I'm talking to your general audience here, and I'm talking what's safe and easy to med, because there's a lot of, a lot of contraindications of certain supplements and nutrients with um, pharmaco, you know, with um, antipsychotics, with antidepressants, you know, you have to be very, very careful. You need to work with a physician who has been trained in drug, drug interaction, drug, herb interaction, drug, nutrient interaction, drug, food interaction. These are critical. So please don't try and do this on your own because you can actually increase suicidal ideations. You can increase serotonin storms. You can increase a lot of terror, like even worsening side effects with well-meaning quote unquote natural therapies. So that being said, that's why breath and magnesium, I feel comfortable that literally anybody could do. You know, I think those are some of things I feel comfortable kind of saying, Hey, give that a whirl to your point is I'm, is I'm either helping somebody lean on or off of a pharmaceutical regimen. Um, I'm taking in all that bigger information. Like for you, Richard, that was such a beautiful example of you needed to address that underlying, you know, congestion that was bogging up the works that you couldn't even use your breath effectively because you couldn't breathe. That's also, you want to make sure you're working with the doctor who is exploring other triggers in your system. You know, if someone is not asking you about your diet, when you're dealing with a mental, emotional issue, you need to fire that person and move on. 
because mm. this is so critical. As I said, we are just a tube with the body wrapped around it. And 80% of our neurotransmitters are made in our gut. We make more serotonin in our GI tract than in our brain. And so what that means is our food is the cofactors and the precursors. And, and if our gut is leaky and irritated, if we're, if we're hemorrhaging out the right nutrients and we're holding on to the wrong and we're irritated and it's creating inflammation in the gut, which therefore spills into the brain, we can't think right. It's not possible. And so people with right. IBS and ulcerative colitis, these folks have a lot of mental, emotional problems. And we used to think that they had, that the depression caused the gut issues. And now we are suspecting that it's the other way around. I noticed in myself, you know, if I'm not feeling good or if I'm ornery or agitated in a given day, mm-hmm. you know, I try not to, but I don't have good interactions, interactions with people. And yeah. I feel like, you know, I, I try very hard not to bring it home and to be mean to the family and stuff. I'm usually mostly successful, but <laughs> you know, when I feel good, then all my relationships are better around me. So I realize, like, you know, when someone doesn't feel well, they'll they'll tend to lash out like a trapped animal because they don't feel well. And they'll be mean and and all that stuff, and they'll feel bad about it. So, yeah, how you feel about yourself, and if you're in pain, and if you're feel like you're disabled, if you feel like you're not listened to, all that I could see would have a big effect. And and you know, to your point, it's like what's that what's that saying that you know people people who cause pain to other people are in pain. And that's where I try to help reframe that for folks as they're going through this journey of people who feel health also place health on others or vitality on others. And so we can have a positive pay it forward as well as a negative pay it forward, depending on the inputs into the system. And each person's input and each person's threshold are going to be unique to them. And so that's the places I don't want people to, you know, to fall short of exploring the why. And I love that we're getting to have this conversation. I wish it was an easy black and white answer, but I want to create that curiosity. And I want to help people understand that, that, you know, that, that you can go from literally suicidal to having unbelievable gratitude and seeing the positive in the world. And so one of the other pieces I wanted to bring up to your tribe that has been, so I've kind of talked about these super low hanging fruit, but when I've cleared all the other things, like we've cleared the toxins, we've gotten on the right diet, we've gotten them into an exercise. I mean, exercise is the best antidepressant out there. You know, I've, we've gotten them into, uh, you know, like clearing out, like understanding and getting the support for their trauma history. And we've dealt with all those things. And yet we're still up against a wall because you see that, you know, I've run across that in my practice, the higher hanging fruit that definitely takes deep evaluation and definitely needs to make sure before you address that, that you've dealt with every other stone, you know, so that you've not left anything unturned. When I have folks that are still stuck in the darkness or in the extreme anxiety, that is where I've reached for um, psychedelics. That's where I've seen unbelievable power of changing, of allowing a new perspective to come into that person's existence that otherwise would not have been available to to them without the support of plant medicines that co-evolved with humanity. Oh, okay. And based on, uh, I've heard like ecstasy seems to help with PTSD, Uh, psilocybin mushrooms seem to help with, you know, end of life crisis due to cancer or like severe depression. I don't know about, about anxiety, but maybe that too, I'm not sure. Both. Um, in fact, there was a great, if, if your group watched, um, I think it was called Incredible Fungi or Fungi Perfecti. It was a recent documentary that Paul Stamets just put out, I don't know, maybe in that last year or so. It's beautiful. It's a stunning documentary. But the latter half of it talks about, I mean, the first half is all just the coolness of the fungi on the planet and then into the medicinal and the edible you know, components of it. And then it moves into the psychedelics towards the end of the documentary. And he himself dealt with extreme severe anxiety to the point that he couldn't function. He had a, a complete uh, stutter. He could not communicate. And one single, I mean, through ever through, I mean, he was in like, he went through tons of different programs and medications and speech therapies for years and years and years to no avail and a single dose of psilocybin which is from the mushroom uh, psychedelic mushroom completely turned that off one dose yeah i have a you know a few people i know that do ketamine infusions that seems to help with rumination you know someone going over the same thing in their mind a thousand times it seems to chill them out 
And what these things are doing that we think, at least one component, is they're creating, they're upregulating this, this chemical in the brain called BDNF, which is a brain-derived neurofactor. And basically, that, that little chemical is in charge of making new neural pathways. And so, folks, there are actually people, there are actually epigenetics on the BDNF SNP as well as something known as the FASNP, F-A-A-H, which is basically our anandamide SNP. So basically on the cannabinoid receptors in the body that you can actually have problems of being able to experience and feel joy. So you can have certain epigenetic hiccups that literally wire you for joylessness. And what we're finding with some of these plant medicines that we co-evolved with is they upregulate these epigenetic expressions. And they open up new receptor sites and they allow the body, like things like low dose naltrexone can upregulate the opiate receptors and cannabis can upregulate the um, CB1, CB2 receptors and um, the psilocybin can upregulate the MDMA receptors and basically turn the body back on to a joy creating machine and create these new neural pathways, these new neural networks that start to give the person a new way of seeing and being and feeling in the world that otherwise didn't exist. Now, all of us have the ability to do that with things like breath work, prayer, meditation, you know, endorphins of exercise, endorphins of even fasting. But some of us are so broken and not broken, I should say, it's just so sort of malformed in or something, you know, just kind of off in some of those uh, pathways um, for a variety of reasons that it sometimes takes a deeper, more intensive intervention to change that up. And psychedelics, I think, have a very powerful role in doing just that. In terms of your method, I guess, a, you know, like a, lar- a big overview of it, are you trying to take the edge off with someone first? So yeah. that they're more responsive to the other treatments or I love that. Know, I love the way you, you approach that. it. Now, I love the way you put that. I want them to number one to know that they're that they're being heard because that's the most important, right? Even if we don't have a solution yet, for someone going through that, they need to feel heard. Because I think our culture is so quick to put them, you know, hush them up, suppress them, medicate them, hide them, don't listen to them. So get them heard, get them safe, get the edge off. And that can very much be, you know, again, um, things like there are, uh, and and again, please, any of these that I'm throwing out there, please speak with your medical provider to see if they're appropriate for you. But but things like L-theanine, pure CBD, the magnesium, hinocchial, which is a magnolia flower extract, chamomile, um, you know, uh, uh, like nervine, nervine tonics. Um, you know, these are very, very, very like passion flower, um, passiflora. These are very powerful um, things to soothe the nervous system. Even, even glutamine or GABA in the right situation. I'd be careful with cancer patients on that, but, but these are some ways that we can really help. And then if folks aren't on pharmaceuticals, then 5-HTP, St. John's Wort, they have a time and a place. Some of my colleagues, Dr. Georgia Ede, E-D-E, her specialty is ketogenic diet with mental emotional disorders. And she has really powerful um, ability to see these patients overcome um, through a dietary intervention. Ketones are very soothing and anti-inflammatory to the brain and and to the gut and to the body in general. So it could be inflammation has been known to be quite a driver for depression specifically. Um, We've known ketones to be very, very calming to the neurological system, to the nervous system. So, you know, our adrenals are tapped into that network as well as our is our emotional body. So those are things we'll want to stabilize first. And then, as I said, through that deeper dive into the detective work of what may wire them, we'll know more pinpointed sort of scalpel ways to approach their um, psychology and their psychiatry and, and bring them much needed relief. Well, very good. So Nisha, what, uh, where can people get help from you? Can you help them if they're all over the world or only U.S. Oh. or where can you help them? Perfect. So, um, you know, in my book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, even though it's very cancer centric, you'll find that it is also very, very geared towards just cleaning up the whole terrain, doing your own audit and knowing what drivers you have. That's going to help you become aware of some of your blind spots. It's also loaded with a ton of resources. 
My website, Dr. Nasha, D-R-N-A-S-H-A.com is also loaded with a lot of free webinars and resources. And I've done talks on mental, emotional stuff. Um, I love like books like Dr. Kelly Turner's um, Radical Remission. It's all about the mental, emotional impact on your cancer outcomes. Folks like Dr. Gabor Mate's work. I just love his stuff on body keeps, you know, the body keeps the score and other components of, of trauma. I really love Dr. Lawrence Lachan's book, Cancer as a Turning Point, because it's all about the psychology behind sort of um, getting cancer and the psychology um, and uh, behind it, but also the psychology to crawl back out of it. Uh, Bernie Siegel's work, uh, Love, Medicine, Miracles, and his work from the 1980s of showing how support systems are integral in us overcoming any of our uh, illnesses, including mental illness and even, you know, cancer di diagnoses. But these are some of the people that I follow and that helped me through changing my mindset. And then that led me into finding more. It's like each one leads you to another. It's like a leapfrog effect of each time you go down one rabbit hole of a resource, it should lead you to 10 more. So those are places to start for sure. And um, I just want to really honor those listening here of just, I want you to just remember you have to be tender with yourself first. And, and I completely know, you know, that place where you feel crazy and you may in fact be crazy in that moment, but you, you don't have to stay there and that there are means of understanding the why and the how to change that for you. Well, very good. Well, Nisha, thank you so much for coming back. I, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Love being here. And thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.